exploration. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Uh, let's see, share the screen. So hopefully everybody can see the screen here. Can, can, can you please confirm it? Okay, thank you. All right, so the, uh, the topic over here is the democratization the access to space. So let's uh, take a look over here. So that's uh, how we operate here in our group. So a wise man once told me, you know, I should dress for the job I want, not the uh, job I have. So we try to pretend like we are the astronauts. So uh, starting into the, uh, looking at IBM's history. So IBM has been a pioneer in this uh, space for a very long time. I mean, starting all the way from the, uh, the Apollo missions and then the uh, Space Shuttle, Endeavour, Columbia, and the uh, Hubble telescope. So we've been involved in lots and lots of different projects. And to date, you know, 50 years ago when we worked together to send men on the moon, that is still considered as the uh, one of the great engineering uh, feats in the in the history. So uh, looking at the uh, global space economy. So the space uh, innovation and exploration, it has always inspired uh, the humanity and all the way from, you know, sending the first uh, man in space to landing men on the moon. And then the Voyagers one and two, which we still get signals from, it's just amazing. Uh, to the Hubble telescope, which has shown us so, some of the most amazing pictures of our universe. To the uh, International Space Station, the Space Shuttle era, the rovers going on the Mars and the various probes which we are exploring the planets and the stars such as Jupiter, Saturn and the Sun. So this uh, global space industry is witnessing an unprecedented growth and no longer are these benefits of these uh, space only available to the government uh, entities, right? In recent times uh, with these technological advances by the private commercial sector, uh, they are challenging the traditional historic space practices by for example, we are seeing the reuse of rockets by SpaceX, and we just recently Rocket Lab did the same thing. Then building these efficient uh, spacecrafts, performing cheap launches, ride-sharing opportunities, and smaller satellites like the uh, CubeSats, NanoSats. And this year alone, we have uh, seen vast activities from launching mega constellations like uh, Starlink from SpaceX, which is supposed to provide the broadband activity to every corner on the planet and the first private uh, crewed uh, spacecraft to uh, reach the ISS, which happened last month, and then different nations like China, Emirates, and the uh, USA sending probes and rovers to the Mars. So this rapid expansion in this, the private commercial companies and the public-private uh, partnerships and advancements in these technologies are defining a new landscape for this new uh, space age and truly democratizing the access to the space. So again, just to you know, overview and by looking at the, by different analysts, by Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, we are looking at a trillion plus dollar industry in the next two decades. Just to give you a bit of a uh, landscape but other different sectors in this uh, space industry. So you have the launchers, varying from large launch to small launch, then you have launch as a service, uh, you have the CubeSats, you have the satellite manufacturers, you have network providers, IoT network, and the 5G edge computing, that plays a huge role over here. Uh, then we have the space tourism, space science, space manufacturing, and one of the major areas in this industry is the uh, data analysis, basically the Earth observation through remote sensing. And then we have the infrastructure, which is uh, just going up. So this just gives you an overview of what different kinds of sectors we have in this uh, industry. Now let's drill down into the, uh, the use cases. So the first use case, uh, which we actually, we actually just finished this uh, working in collaboration with the uh, International Space Station, NASA and the uh, HPE. So there's a DNA sequencing, which happens on the space station and the way it worked today, basically the requests are sent to the space station where the astronauts, they'll take a swipe at the different surface and then they run through the DNA sequencer. And after that, once the results are done, 
uh, it's, they are pushed back to the ground. And this whole process can take up to a couple of months. So we thought of the edge computing, right? Instead of what, what edge computing means is where you are pushing the compute to where data is being produced. So we worked with the, with the uh, ISS and the NASA folks and HPE to, to build the code which will actually do the computation right on the space station. And we have reduced this uh, from literally from two months to it. The whole run takes about six to 10, nine, between six to 10 hours. So within a day or two, we can get these results down. So all these concepts which we are trying to implement on the ground with the 5G networks as edge computing, we took a similar approach and we are trying to do that on the space station. These systems will fly on February 1st on the, uh, I think, NG15 mission. So, and it's using our Red Hat Code Ready Container single node uh, OpenShift cluster. That's one use case of edge computing. The other use cases of edge computing is, like for example, in case of, a, let's say, a natural disaster, how can we locate and access, assess the extent of damage to a given building by automating the analysis of imagery and help these government agencies and the first responders to expedite relief for the disaster areas? How can we predict the future uh, variations in water resource levels? And with the recent fires which happened in uh, Australia and in California, watching the human mobility patterns and predicting the urban planning and challenges of the future. Basically, this all falls under the Earth observation. And with all these satellites who are doing this Earth observation, how can we do these analysis on the satellites as much as possible? The next use case is the uh, looking at is the uh, space situational awareness. This is a very hot topic these days. Basically what it means, it has different areas in this. So let's pick the first one, space debris. So you probably uh, hear a lot about that there is a lot of debris in the space. And to date we have launched around like 9,000 satellites. And in the next three years, we are talking about launching more than 20,000 satellites. And that's because of these uh, and mega constellations which are going up from Starlink and Cooper and Telesat and OneWeb, and there are more who are coming to provide this uh, uh, internet uh, global, you know, from from the low Earth orbit. But that creates a lot of traffic, a lot of conjunction in the low Earth orbit. So we uh, worked uh, in collaboration with the university here at UT Austin. We built an open source project, which is the links are listed at the bottom where we are looking at the orbital production. Basically, we build machine learning models that are trained to predict the errors in the physical models, which are predicting the orbits. Then we also build uh, machine learning models which can look for conjunction. So for example, if I want to do a search of how many, uh, you know, which of these two objects are coming closer to each other within 100 kilometers. So you can do different kinds of search all through the API driven. Then the other challenge which we have with all these constellations which are being planned to go up is the pollution in the orbit, right? So for example, you have these gigantic uh, radio telescopes and astronomers who are doing deep space observation. Now, if you have all of these, imagine these 30,000 satellites or 20 plus thousand are just uh, you know, in your orbit, it will create a lot of noise in your data which you are trying to do observation. So we are working on another open source project to tell the astronomers what's the best time to go and do your deep observations. So how can you avoid you know, the, uh, the noise in, in, in the orbit? Now, the other thing from space debris, which is, uh, this is a very uh, serious matter because uh, in, on September 22nd, uh, sp the, we had two astronauts on the space station. And there was this debris from the upper stage of a rocket, which came within three kilometers of, uh, of the space station. And they actually had to do the evacuation, the two astronauts, to go into the emergency uh, spacecraft for exiting. So, and this was a third maneuver of space station just this year. So, I mean, and, and these are very, very expensive procedures to do. So it is definitely a, a serious thing. Now the third piece of the space mission awareness is the space traffic management. And this is where, you know, how you, uh, how, you, how the different agencies can share information and can we have a better idea, you know, what's up there in the orbit. So the, uh, 
satellite providers or the planners, they can do better planning and have better idea of what's coming in the path of their, you know, of the uh, of space object. So, another technology which we uh, we have worked on and we are looking into is the is a blockchain. So, the basic purpose of blockchain is to provide the trust, transparency, and provenance. And an ideal use case which you probably aware of are the supply chain optimization. Now, if we take the similar concept and we look at the space industry, we have very similar things. So let's take an example of whether it's satellite manufacturing or sending the space cargo. You know, the Dragon just docked yesterday with the space station, and now we have two Dragons. One took the crew and one took the, the cargo, right? So if you, for example, if you look at the whole uh, process, uh, a company wants to, you know, send new satellites. They they contact the satellite manufacturers. These satellite manufacturers have their suppliers, subcontractors, and then you, know, you can imagine all the testing and validation which is happening back and forth, just in that one segment. Then you have the launch service provider. You have the mission control center. You have the trans transportation in between. You have the operations. You have the regulatory authorities. You have the insurance companies. So you can see how many different entities are involved in just one mission. And this is where a blockchain can provide a distributed ledger and, and, and record all the transactions happening. And then anyone in this system can have access, you know, based on the whatever the role-based access is defined, they can see what's happening and they can go and find the provenance if anything goes wrong. Uh, in 2019, in the, in the, I think in the first quarter, SpaceX reported that one of their suppliers, they were forging signatures for the Falcon 9 system. Now, one can only imagine if, you know, anything goes wrong with the rocket launch, right? And that's why I think these systems can, uh, can really help and give the trust and transparency to all the parties involved. Uh, next thing, uh, again, uh, what we observed this year, uh, this year was the year of Mars, right? So we saw three nations sending different things, right? So China, they, they sent a, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover, and it has different, it will be conducting different kinds of, you know, scientific missions to map the morphology, geological structures, surface soil characteristics, water ice distribution, analyzing the materials, and so forth. Then there was a Hawk probe which went from the Emirates. It also had science instruments and to study the Martian atmosphere. And this was an orbiter which will be orbiting the uh, the Mars. And then NASA sent the orbiter as well as the so NASA also sent the rover with perseverance, which will go and look for the signs of ancient Mars life. And all of these missions will land sometime in February next year. And then uh, SpaceX Starship. I mean. Today it was supposed to do its uh, test flight, which is uh, almost 12.5 kilometers above going to the altitude flight test. So hopefully this week, I mean, it got aborted, but you can see a lot of activity is happening in this industry. And this and the smart is just, is just fascinating, you know, uh, because I think this last week when uh, Elon Musk was interviewed, he said in two years, they're looking to send the uh, unmanned, uncrewed, uh, Starship to Mars, and in four to six years, possibly humans to the Mars. So we'll see. I mean, a lot is happening in this area. The another big area is the Artemis. So if you have heard of the Artemis program, this is basically going back to the moon uh, in 2024. So the Artemis program has created a huge ecosystem for the space industry. So you can imagine the launchers, the uh, lander, the rovers, uh, this time, this program says that uh, we are going to stay there. So you are, there will be construction over there. There will be uh, data centers being built. The uh, 4G network has already been uh, 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 assigned to Nokia to go and build over there. So it has for, uh, you know, a wide, huge range of activities going to the moon and then beyond, which is going to the Mars. And then in between, there is also this... Uh, Lunar Gateway. So Lunar Gateway is very similar to what we have, the space station. The space station is orbiting, of course, the Earth, and the Lunar Gateway will be orbiting the, the Moon. So again, thinking about all the concepts of, okay, how are you going to do the uh, 
asset configuration management, right? There's, there's a huge, uh, there's a lot of things which can be done in the context of just this uh, Artemis mission. Last but not least, uh, going forward, right? Uh, many nations now, because if you, if you have noticed, many nations have come up with their uh, space programs and they all aspire to you know, send satellites into the space. The, unfortunately, it's not that straightforward. It's, it's quite challenging to, you know, uh, because of the cost, the logistics, and then there are only few countries who have the launchers. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex process. What I envision going forward, that we will have a very similar model which we have on the ground today as, as cloud computing, where you don't have to worry about setting up data centers, systems, right? All you care about is running your payload and you get the results back. Same thing, I think, for the, uh, for the lower Earth orbit, the satellites should happen in form of small sets like CubeSats, where if I'm a, any nation, right, a developing nation or university STEM programs, they want to go and send, uh, you know, they want to have access to the space. So what they can do is they can, you know, write their code, a payload, and just push that payload to this CubeSat, which is already in the orbit. The, the CubeSat has defined a set of uh, different uh, sensors, and there's an API for it. So you just basically, you're writing your code, which is calling those API from the CubeSat for those different sensors. And let's say an easy example is the camera, right? So if you are looking for certain, I don't know, uh, melting glaciers, for example, or the droughts, a particular science uh, experiment you're interested in, you just send your payload to this CubeSat, it runs for a while, does its you know, collection, and you get your results back. What this will do, I mean, this will basically bring everybody in the game, right? So it, it's a pay-as-you-go model, very economical. You as a user focus on your payload. It's a very low barrier to entry, right? And anyone should be able to participate. So I think that's I think that will really democratize the access to space, and more innovation will happen, you know, as we go. So as a, you know, in briefly, I took you through you know a variety of different areas, technological areas which are defining the new uh, space areas in our age, and there's a lot of major projects happening like Artemis and Mars pro pro programs. So uh, so. Uh, Thank you so much for, uh, for tuning in. Naeem, thank you very much. Question real quick is, how much of this can uh, the average, let's call them armchair astronomer, space mm -hmm. enthusiast, how much can they get involved? How can they get involved? So yeah, that's why, you know, one of the examples which I just gave like CubeSat, right? So, that's one example where you work with the, let's say we have the major space agencies uh, in, in the world, right? And for United Nations have a very good program called UNUSA, uh, Outer Space Program. And they are trying to access to all these developing nations who want to be part of this uh, new space age. So I think these are the different agencies where the countries or the universities can engage and then have some programs as part of their STEM to get you know the next generation world. I'm not sure. Have you ever met Kent Colors, blind astronomer? Do you remember the movie Contact? Yes. And there was a blind individual in there. That's Kent Colors, and Kent Colors is an astronomer. But he was also one of the founders of SETI, search for the, the search for extra intelligence. Yes. Yeah, so you know about SETI. They were utilizing that that really interesting yes. way of somehow linking everyone's computers together doing a screen share time. And I'm wondering, yes. that was probably one of the largest projects where people worked together as a collaborative force to look into space. Is there anything like that mm -hmm. happening right now today? So, I mean, but that's, a, that's a great idea. I mean, we were also a part of that study, you know, 10 to 10 years ago where every, you know, every idle compute was contributing to it, right, to searching for the, for the extraterrestrial stuff. But I think the same crowdsourcing approach can be used for, let's, for example, like the Earth observation data, doing analysis for all these, you know, if we saw in last 12 months, these major wildfires in the Australia and uh, in California, this compute power can be used. And similar thing for, here's another example, I think where it can really help. 
So now with this pandemic, which we're all going through, right, uh, and the vaccine coming, I mean, this is a very critical time that, all, that there's a limited amount of vaccine and we have seven to eight billion people. How does this get uh, distributed? How do you track all this stuff, right? How can you use remote sensing, the 5G networks on the ground, and using satellite Earth observation? How can you take this enormous amount of data and get it computed and start tracking? I think this is where the crowdsourcing can really help. So, Naeem, I'd love for you to introduce Eric to us. Tell us more about Eric. Yes, so Eric is uh, a distinguished uh, colleague here based in France, and uh, he was the uh, pioneer of this, uh, this amazing project, uh, Mayflower Autonomous Ship, which we all work together. And, you know, I don't want to steal his thunder, but I mean, I would love for Eric to take us through for this amazing first of a kind project. Eric? Yeah, thank you, Naeem. So, good morning from Nice in France, and let me share my screen with you. No, hopefully this is working. So, can you all see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, I'm... I'm actually going to take you down to the earth. You know, it's like we were in deep space with Naeem and um, uh, the, the purpose now is to show you how we can do something on the sea for the benefit of the planet. And, uh, and instead of doing it with a normal ship, do it with uh, something like quite different. So you should be able to actually see the real ship on the right side of your screen right now, on the screen. If the video is flowing correctly, I can't see it myself, but that's actually the Mayflower that I'm going to talk about and specifically what's inside it. So in, um, that's, that's a project that was Eric, initiated Eric, in 2016, Eric, so Eric, it's Eric, quite you, uh, some time ago. Share, excuse me, Eric, can you share the PowerPoint? Are we running it locally or is, that, is he running it there? Eric, do me a favor. <clears throat> can you run the PowerPoint? So can you click? So it expands to the whole screen because we don't we only see the slides themselves. Ah, you don't see the full screen? No, we don't. So it's on your second screen. Can you share your your second screen? No. Um, okay. So. So yeah, hit, click slideshow because we're not seeing the slideshow. We're seeing your your PowerPoint. So what do you see now? We see each one of your slides. Your two through thirteen. Okay. So let me. Uh, let me start it again. I'm sorry for this. Just like okay. it was yesterday. The top. See what's the slide. Are you seeing it now? It's not in presentation mode. It's just like how you have opened the slide. Okay. Let it's not full screen. Screen. Uh, is so it better you, this way? Well, do you have any form of animation or anything that's inside your slides? Because we won't see those then. Okay, so you know, no, I don't have it. So what I'm going to instead of trying to share PowerPoint, which is failing on me, I'm going to share the P uh, PDF, and that's gonna that's Wait, gonna make it. So give me one sec. Okay. Sorry for the sorry to share. It's okay. Button. It's okay. You, you, Naeem, can you I'm just so go over there? I prepare go over the, to Eric's yeah. real quick and help him, will you? Will you go over to his house? <laughs> yes, I have my rocket ready. <laughs> yeah, Naeem is uh, a, cre a really big uh, geek. <laughs> but he cannot afford a, a seat on SpaceX yet. Ooh. Not yet. So is it because of is it an app he's using or is it a in-browser um, tool? What, what are we using right now? Do you know? I'm using uh, the, the browser. It's a browser. That's okay. Don't worry. I'm going to share the... Um, instead of sharing the, the PowerPoint, I'm, sh I'm going to share the, the PDF. Okay. Let's try that out. Merci. So now you should actually get my screen completely, and now that should that should be a full screen. So you see it in full screen now. 
We see full screen, yes. yes. Okay, good. So there is, there is no animation, so you'll be okay. I'm not doing animation, not skilled enough. So back to the ship. So this, this actually started in 2016, so it's not a very recent story. And uh, Naeem uh, uh, and I met on this project uh, quite a long time ago. And essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a project that was created with two big mission or objective. Uh, the first one being, uh, you know, actually uh, commemorate the, the first uh, crossing of the Atlantic by the, uh, you know, the first group of uh, real population settlers that went into the, the British colonies in, uh, in North America. Uh, and that's, that's a, big, a big thing for the American culture. I mean, it's like a very large event. It's commemorated every year with the Thanksgiving uh, uh, weekend uh, holidays. So it's very big, culturally speaking. And, uh, and uh, the second objective uh, in this is instead of carrying passengers and you know, doing a, a wood replica of the ship, they said, well, let's do something for science. Uh, the team that launched this, and this has uh, been launched as a non-profit experiment, is, uh, is made with a lot of scientific people, you know, archaeologists, I mean, sea archaeologists, scientists, and they said, let's, let's collect more data. Uh, we have more data on space and planets than we have on the on the home planet, so they really wanted science to be uh, the lead in, in this experience. And the second mission for this was, well, you know, if it is doing it without anybody on board, it's a good bench for proofing a new technology for navigation. So, you know, essentially, we have tons of robotic tools. I mean, anybody can buy a, a drone and you have some kind of track following and, you know, essentially basic robotic reactive, uh, you know, autopilot type things. And let's try to get into a, a high level ma uh, decision making in a ship and uh, come close to what a real ship will do. So that, that's the second, you know, objective of, of that ship. And, and you see it's a, it's a very flat ship. You can see it on the, on the drawing. It runs on on cells, solar cells, batteries, and there is a backup generator when it lacks energy. And it's uh, it's made in metal, so it's pretty sturdy. Not not the kind of you know competition or sailing competition type ship, but uh, designed to sustain uh, uh, shocks, uh, designed to, to navigate for a long time type ship. So that's that's kind of the, the two big angles of that mission. And if you look at the science. Uh, right now, and that's that's a very uh, you know, fresh uh, uh, list. We have eight experiments on board. So the middle of the ship is a huge bay, and uh, and you see they will collect a lot of data. They will collect oceanographic data. You know, just the regular, you know, sensors. Uh, they're gonna measure uh, microplastic pollution. They're gonna measure uh, some specific, you know, carbonates, dissolved carbonate uh, chemistry with um, uh, an IBM uh, sensor called uh, an hypertest sensor. They're going to measure the sea level. It's very important to measure sea levels, and that's going to use actually satellites, you know, high precision uh, um, GPS or GNSS. They're going to measure wave energy. They're going to measure anomalies on the ship, so they're going to can listen to the ship with AI systems. Uh, they're going to test future navigation system for the ship. And they're also going to do a, a whale sensor. So there's a bunch of data that's going to be collected. Some of it will be transferred when the ship gets a connection. And I'm going to go back to the connection later. And um, as you were saying about you know community crowdsourcing, uh, they want this data when the scientists uh, allow it to be shared as soon as possible. So you know people can actually get the data and do things with it, like students, schools, or scientists. So that that's very important. You know. Uh, we have to, to be cognitive that this, the objective is to collect science on the ocean. Now, when you want to do this and you want to navigate, um, there are two big aspects uh, in a non-connected or very minimal connectivity type ship. Uh, the first accept is how do you manage this edge situation? You know, you have no or little connection. It's, um, and I can make a parallel with space there. Uh, in space, you have a big latency and you have a very low throughput, unless you are in low orbit, okay? When you are actually in deep space, you have not much uh, throughput possible. That's, uh, the ship has very little throughput when connected uh, in the range from 60 bits per second to 300 uh, k bits per seconds. So that's not a lot when you have it. 
and the plan is to be able to be able to navigate without it. And then, um, uh, so you see no latency in the ship, big latency, but throughput is very bad and, uh, and you have to be highly secure. You don't want your edge uh, to be compromised. There is little chance that somebody is going to touch a satellite or is going to actually board the ISS to touch, you know, Naim's code. Uh, if it's on the ship in the middle of the ocean and alone, you know, things could happen. So you have to be very uh, aware of security challenges. So that's the first piece. And the second piece is how do you implement, you know, the regulations? Uh, and the people listening to me are probably, you know, remembering we've been sailing the oceans and the seas for centuries. And uh, so this is a, a very old activity with lots of regulations not always very well applied by the humans, but still very highly regulated uh, in, uh, I mean, either in the deep ocean or on coastal areas. Actually, the more close to the coast, the more regulated it is. And, and then you have to do something which is very, uh, I would say, uh, practical. Uh, if the ship is navigating by itself without any human on board, no man on the loop, no remote control type activity, it has to be able to explain any decision taken. And uh, that's uh, a very strong requirement in this, um, in this project. So, uh, and, and by the way, uh, you can see my red text, you know, don't hit anything. That's, you know, whatever rules you have, you know, avoid an accident. And uh, so that second set is uh, actually making it um, uh, an interesting hybrid uh, AI. So not a simple AI uh, type project. So let me... Move it. So if you look, and that's a pretty busy page, but this is just to give you an idea of, of where are the functions that you want to have in a project like this. So first you have the ship with all the sensors, computing and, you know, acting, which is, you know, moving the propeller and, uh, and moving the rudder. Then you have uh, that ship is having some time of connection, you know, typically by satellite, but it's, it's capable of other type of connections. And then you have two off-site, off-the-ship uh, type things. You have, the, you have the maker site, you know, where they develop and they want to, you know, send stuff and receive stuff from the ship and, and they want to control the mission. So in your new program, it's also, you know, this is where you're going and the, this is the weather information. And then you have the, the exploring or, or the, you know, the the sensor outputs uh, site. So people want to be able to follow the mission. Scientific want to have access to the data. Schools want to be able to, you know, see where the ship is. So three places to put um, activities or functions in, in a system like this. So when you do it, uh, you actually have something that looks like this. So very simplified diagram, but uh, essentially, uh, if you if you want to use the the press or the technical journals. Uh, uh, you know, keywords, it's, uh, it's a very interesting edge and hybrid cloud solution because uh, when you do it, then you have your ship on the left. In the ship, you have the science, you have the navigation, and we call it the AI captain. And this is a, uh, uh, that has to communicate intermittently. So with satellite 4G, Wi-Fi, 5G maybe, to a cloud where you have uh, the public access, you know, access to the data, you have the science access, you know, scientific are going to collect the data. This is where also uh, you compute the weather and we do it with uh, the weather company. And then this is all linked, you know, in a solid way to the control center where not only you do the development, but you're going to manage the, the ship, you know, you know, you're going to tell the ship, where are you going? You're going to be able to do emergency action it like, you know, please stop, you know, stay where you are. Or, or go save somebody, like uh, in the, the current you know, race around the, the planet, and you're gonna also be able to do some high-level optimization because of efficiency and, and do analytics. So that's, that's the on-prem stuff. So you see, it's a, it's a really interesting edge situation, and um, you could actually relate this very much to what uh, uh, Naim is doing with the ISS. You know, replace the ship by the ISS, you have something that looks very similar, and. Uh, and, and that's normal. So that's that's the way it's uh, spread out into the systems. And then you have to make sure this is highly secure. So, you know, the the, the primary uh, attack vector on a, on a on a system like this is the is the communication channel, which is encrypted. But you have physical security to be present on the ship. 
you have to make sure your navigation system is you know spoof proof so somebody cannot you know come in there plug an usb key and uh, change the software and from the the management side you have to make sure that uh, your cloud uh, software is highly secure and that's uh, it's going to be able to detect if the ship it's talking to and it's one ship now it could be like 100 ships is the right ship the right software and that's not been compromised and then the, the the next level of security is you know the on-prem control center. You don't want anybody to actually get there and do something negative to it. So you see, it's a it's a pretty interesting uh, set of security uh, checkpoints to make sure they are very safe, uh, very uh, efficient, so nobody can uh, you know impact the mission. So let's talk about uh, what kind of decision that ship has to make. So beyond the infrastructure. Um, if you look at the ship and all its sensors, this is the kind of question you have to resolve when you are, you know, collecting the sensor data. You know, what is out there? Uh, you know, what should I do? You know, what's the rule? Do I uh, do I have to give way to that thing? Uh, what's the the best route to a point? Uh, and then you come into some interesting consideration, like uh, it's a battery-operated ship. So how do you maximize? The battery level to get where you want to go, and uh, and then what's the safe route? You know, if you look at the picture here, you have all those ships. If they are moving, uh, you know, what what is safe? If in front of you you have a fisherman ship, is it safe to go behind the ship? Well, actually, it's not because it could be a, a net, and it could be in the act of fishing, so it could be very dangerous. So, those kind of decisions. And if you look at those questions that you have to answer. Uh, if you are just uh, uh, just a regular captain on a on a ship, and that's not you know a computer set of questions, it's a it's a captain question. You have to to kind of put them in a hierarchical model. So uh, it, it's very interesting that uh, the way uh, the the decision making is made on, on that case is very similar to what's called the Pavlov pyramid on on psychology. But essentially, you go from the bottom, very low level. Uh, type things like you know make sure you are alive and uh, you know you're facing the wave so you don't get overturned to going up into you know what's around you how do you make sure you are applying the rules and you do the right stuff and then there is the high level uh, stuff which is uh, you know I'm going there and I'm con I'm going to collect data you know and maybe you know that experiment that's listening to whales wants me to go a little bit to the west and can I go to that place to measure the sounds with the level of battery I have. So three levels of, uh, of decision making. And, and when you map this into AI uh, software, um, and this is done with three types of AI. So there is a lot of, um, uh, I would say, a world about AI on the press. And a lot of people are, are confusing AI with deep learning, you know, neural networks technology. But actually, there are more than this in AI software. And if you want to make those kind of decisions, actually, you're going to leverage deep learning you're going to leverage prescriptive logic. So if you're old enough, you've heard about expert systems. So this is the new version of expert systems. So inference systems based on rules. And then you're going to actually use uh, optimization uh, software or linear programming to actually uh, you know, find the best option. And, and when you do this, uh, back to my initial comment, you actually have to make sure you're totally auditable by rule of law. You need to be able to prove to the, you know, the, the the public organization that this boat is taking this decision because of those reasons, and this is the progress of the decision. The same way they would interrogate a, a captain and ask him why did you do this. So the boat has to be able to do this. So those three things actually assemble in this way. So it's pretty busy, and I'm going to take time to explain it. And this is something that you know we've been working with them for quite a long time. So. On the left, you have the sensors. I just represented, you know, a few of them: vision, radar, local weather, AIS, which is like the, you know, every boat is supposed to, to transmit its position above a certain size. And then on the right, you have the the control center and what what's remote to you. So, uh, first thing that's happening in a ship like this is you take all the sensors, uh, especially the the vision, and you're gonna structure that data. So vision is not an a structured type of data. This is where 
uh, they use a, a set of deep learning models to actually, you know, define what's out there. So is it a buoy, is it a swimming person, or is it a, you know, I don't know, a floating container? And uh, in those sensors, you know, one I didn't represent that's interesting is, uh, is the front-facing sonar, so you can detect floating objects. So you, you need to structure that data. So this is where you have deep learning. And, uh, and just to, to give you an idea, this is not uh, everybody's uh, cup of tea, because remember, you are at sea, you're on a small boat, it's only 15 meters, uh, it's moving. So, you know, processing vision on a moving set of cameras with, you know, various type of weather, it's uh, kind of an interesting challenge. And uh, so we're not talking about simple stuff. They did work on um, models and collecting data samples for four years before starting first tests uh, last month. So you can imagine it's not, um, you know, an easy take something off the shelf and, uh, and run it. So you, you start from this unstructured data everywhere. You structure everything and you actually fuse all the data. So you come to a point where you have a representation of everything around you. And so this is, you know, the, the piece of, of, of sensing. And then you go up in the chain of uh, complexity. You're going to apply to all the objects that you've identified around you, the natural you know, regulations and the, the good rules of a captain. So that's where um, there is the use of rural engines. And we use uh, actually an IBM software for this called uh, ODM. And so this is where um, those rules are going to decide what are the actions to take for every target. And, uh, and to do that piece, um, they essentially took captains, you know, sea captains, you know, ex corvette captains, ex uh, civilian or military captains, and those guys actually coded the rules. You know, this is done in language, not in programs. So this is not programmatic action, it's a language action. And so they have created rules and tested them for quite some time to actually resolve the one-to-one -one problem, you know, the Mayflower versus any other contact. Once you've done that, you have a set of options, which are the good options to take. And for example, you know, if you're facing a, a rock, uh, and the rock is actually, you know, confirmed because it's on the map, it's on the radar, it's on the video, then, you know, you're going to have a result which is avoid the rock. And so with those one-to-one -one, uh, solutions, you're going to go into another level, which is, you know, how you make the, the best decision. And for doing this, that's where optimization, you know, linear programming system are used. This is where you actually are going to merge the weather data, the mission objective, and you're going to resolve the multi-ship problem. So, you know, you're in a bay, there are 50 ships around you, you know, fix it. What's the best route to your target? And out of this, this is how you get to back into the, I would say, the bottom robotic, dynamic control, you know, the regular, you know, uh, robotic system, and you control your rudder and your speed of, um, of ship. So you see it's kind of an interesting process going up from sensors data, raw sensor data into, you know, higher level decisions where you, you're going to mix uh, local data, the maps, the weather, uh, and also where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do, and then come to, you know, action on the rudder and the, and the engine of the ship. And then sometime, you know, you're going to get a connection and get that weather, get that uh, uh, stuff from your control center and, and possibly send data back to them for actually, uh, you know, doing investigation on the oceanographic data. So that's kind of a, uh, a quick description of how it works. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's really hybrid because you have all the blocks of AI you can find. I mean, there are more technology, but, you know, the, the most common ones. And uh, that's what, what runs the ship. And uh, a little bit, I have a little bit of time, I see, uh, on the optimization. So optimization, is interesting uh, subject in there because essentially this is what you have. So every second you're gonna assess what's around you. So if you've done the right work on your sensors, uh, you are in the middle and that's the red circle and you go to the red point, this is what you are, you are going to have in your, your system. All the other objects and you have to find the best route going to the, to the red point. And uh, it's, uh, it's actually an interesting problem it's a, it's a NP program type, so it's exponentially complex. And, um, and that's where uh, linear programming is very useful. So uh, 
we are thinking when we do this, uh, things like, you know, this kind of bay, but uh, one example that we've been asked to look at is, you know, if you're in Singapore, uh, the Singapore Bay is one of the busiest bay. Not every ship used AIS or behaves correctly. How do you handle this? So uh, one of the big shipping company even told us, okay, you're in Singapore, uh, there are fishermen, it's at night and there is fog. Okay, how, what, what, what is your software going to decide in those situations? Well, so this is something that uh, actually is going to be verified very soon because they did put the water, the sea, the boat in the water yesterday and they're starting sea tests right now. Okay, so what's coming next? So uh, first, uh, thank you for listening to me. I hope it's, uh, you've learned something. Uh, there is a website on the right of the screen, it's uh, mis400.com, and you'll be able to follow the ship. Uh, I really invite you to follow the ship, it's very interesting. They are doing the test now at sea, uh, which means, you know, making sure the boat, or uh, the she navigates correctly, they integrate the system, they are doing autonomy tests, you know, how does it behave? Does it behave as it was behaving in the testing grid uh, uh, on real sea, they're going to integrate the eight science experiments in the big bay in the middle. And the plan is to cross uh, the ocean uh, spring 2021, come back um, in by the, uh, on the Atlantic following the Challenger route. Uh, Challenger was the first big oceanographic uh, or real oceanographic research ship. And then they plan to operate the ship and open uh, the, the experiment bay to scientists for 10 years. It's planned to last for quite some time. And uh, what's interesting is that at the same time this is happening and we're just testing the ship, you know, there is already uh, people that are very interested by the technology. So uh, the, the interests are, are very different uh, and, and very interesting. So the merchant and the leisure industry is interested by not the autonomy, but just before the autonomy, something that can be like a, a, a never sleeping, uh, you know, intelligent thing telling you, you know, you should do that or you should not do that or something bizarre is happening. Um, there is interest then uh, from uh, the defense, you know, whether ship or submarines, uh, they want autonomy because they want to you know, not put people at harm's risk. So send a, sending an autonomous ship is better than sending, you know, real people and risking their lives. Uh, there is interest in ports because uh, you can take the same solution and watch a port and decide, you know, is anybody behaving abnormally? You know, somebody speeding, somebody not following the rules in the port. So uh, we are discussing with ports about this. And then um, the, back to the principal, you know, mission of the ship, which is science and research. Actually, uh, that kind of ship is much, much cheaper than those big research ship with hundreds of people aboard. You can send it to a place where, uh, you know, nobody wants to go. And you can imagine doing things that's, uh, you know, very close to what people do in space uh, with, you know, swarms of microsatellites. You can actually navigate a swarm of Mayflower-like ships and collect data points in the various places of the ocean at the same time. So a lot of work in the research potentially there. So I'm done. Thank you. Any questions? So Eric, you and Naeem need to work together because Naeem has to have the, the satellite. Uh, we are working together. You have to. You know, <laughs> it only works. We, we are you working have... together and uh, we have a lot of things we're trying to do. We'd like to connect the ship to the ISS when the ISS is over, over it because it could mean to actually high speed channel to the ISS, you know, some other computation. Uh, we are discussing, you know, could we do some quantum computing on the, on the ship data while it's passing over the ISS? So there's plenty of subjects. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, you know, you have to recognize those things do take time. You know, 2016, it's navigating now. Uh, you know, the tests that have been done with the initial, you know, AI systems are, uh, you know, in French we say s'adéquat, which uh, I don't think there is an English equivalent, you know, it's, kind of blow your mind because it's working so well. So I'm very happy about this for the company doing it with us. But, uh, you know, watch watch your next steps, you know, and, you know, there is a chance that you see something between uh, the ship and space. You're doing this in April of 2021. 2021. Right? April 2021 is when yeah, it returns. Yeah, the, the navigation is planned for, for April. That's correct. Okay. And then let's just take this to another level. A decade from now, if all this works well, 
how do you incorporate this into something larger? Will you actually see this in ocean vessels? Would you see this in cargo and freight? Uh, yeah, yeah, it could be. That's what I was saying uh, in the last, uh, you know, uh, chart. The um, the feature that it brings by having all this logging capability, explainability, is uh, is the best log you could ever create in a, in a regular ship. Without the autonomy, there is no need of autonomy on on big ships. You know, there is some autonomy that will come for the mooring and some approach levels. But that's, I would say, not uh, real autonomy. It's more or less robotic, very reactive type of uh, of activity that's uh, already common in RVs. Uh, they, there's the, no intent to suppress the 10 people that are in a tanker. You need them. And, and they don't cost much money, honestly, compared to the cost of the ship and the cargo. But that would be a very big uh, addition in, ter in terms of safety for, you know, not missing something on the lookout, for example. Because right. it and will speed. look out all the time. And Eric, speed is not what's important, it's accuracy, correct? Eric? Can I you said repeat, speed, please? speed is not what is important, it's more accuracy. In terms of what? Navigation from point to point, getting to where you need to go. If you do this fast, there's more chance for error, correct? I uh, mean, the vessel itself. Uh, Actually, there is, we don't really reason in those terms. Uh, you know, there is no notion of speed in boats. You know, one evaluation every second is way enough. Uh, you need to be, uh, yeah, accuracy is important because you don't want to hit somebody, right? Well, no, I was thinking, so in autonomous vehicles, let's say freight, when a truck goes from point A to point B, it first is accuracy, and then they put speed. So at a level four, they're finally able to put speed inside autonomy. Level five, of course, it's operating almost as if it's a human driving it. And I'm wondering, as you then propel this out to be a decade from now, so if you're doing freight, if you're doing cargo containers, from getting from point A to point B, you know, right now it might take six weeks to get something from, let's say, from Hong Kong to um, Long Beach, California. So. If you do it in an autonomous environment, right now it would probably take maybe 12 weeks or 18 weeks because it needs to go slow to be accurate. To uh, but that, that, that's, that's an incorrect reasoning. Today, if we apply this technology to, a, I would say, a big motor ship, it, it will, you can go faster. But that's was, the idea then. There was then. a joke so, in the team that we could, we, we, could, we, could, we could beat any sailing competitors with that kind of ship. That's great news then. So this is something so, that... So, no, because you, you know, you're, you're making the comparison with the cars where you need to have, a, you know, millisecond type decision making. Uh, and uh, that's not the case on the ship. And then, uh, and then, yes, with the current technology they use on the cars, the result is, is like if you are putting a grandma to drive the car. Right. Uh, so don't, that's very... Don't, don't mix the two. It's different. And, and tell me... IBM being involved with this. How does this benefit IBM? How is this interesting for IBM? Yes. Well, uh, the, the vision piece is actually done on IBM system that compile the models in very big, I mean, very high speed. And, and you need it because creating those layers of models and preparing that, uh, you know, that system requires, you know, high compute efficiency. So they do use, you know, uh, power system with GPUs to do the, the model training. They, they, you don't need big system on the ship to do the inference or to execute, but to prepare them, you need you know you need those kind of those kind of systems, and they use you know uh, open source software you know specially tuned for those systems also to do it very fast. I mean you have to imagine that this is this is millions of retrainings since they started the project. It's very exciting. You know, and, and doing AI project with vision, like the, the, the deep learning, you know, this is not like you train, you're done, and you're happy. This is, this is uh, actually fake news. What you need is you re permanently collecting data, and you're permanently retraining. Just like you fix a bug in your software, you're going to retrain the system. And then you're going to go back, execute, and fail the system. So that's, that's where we bring technology. And the rule systems are, is an IBM software. The optimization system is, an, is an, an IBM software. Both come from the finance sector. And then more important in there, the infrastructure for the edge management. This is the same as the one Naeem was described, describing for space. This is based on, uh, you know, 
open ship, open shift uh, features for managing uh, edges. Now you so might ask a crazy question. We put to you. a lot of technology in there. We didn't push it; they asked for it. So they tested all the technology and they selected our technology. They don't use IBM software, for example, for the pipeline development because they found that they had another, you know, better solution. But uh, on those bricks that I described, they they did select our bricks, our technology bricks, on the base of their actual value. All right, Naeem, crazy question for you. So Vin Cerf is a friend of mine. Vin, of course, I'm not sure if you know Vin is. He is uh, one of the founders of the internet. He helped create the internet. He works over at Google now. And he said something that was pretty shocking recently. He said they found a way to go faster than the speed of light for computing. And they're utilizing it in space. So Google is under this new project to enhance communication by going faster than the speed of light. Have you heard anything about this? No, there has been a lot of discussions. Like, for example, now they say the speed of light is a hindrance. For example, if you're looking at this uh, fast trading between the in a stock exchange, actually there is a technology they are talking about doing this trading from the space, and that's where the Starlink can play a role. I, do, I don't exactly recall the, the technology, but I read a few months ago that you know the the speed from the orbit to the ground will be faster and it can help on the speed of flight can be faster than that so when you're doing trading you're you're talking about micro milliseconds right making their decisions so definitely there is work going on and that will also be helpful in space for example with if we are planning to go to mars right uh, it takes 40 minutes for back and forth transmission 40 minutes is a long time yeah. And that's why we will need these breakthrough to have a faster communication. And that's exactly it. So it's kind of like the four minute mile that was always a limitation. Eventually then uh, the speed of sound was a limitation. And then cracking the concept of speed of light is a limitation. But overcoming that, it just transforms communication at another level, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. Yes. Well, both Naeem yeah. and Eric, thank you so much for sharing time with us. Very exciting what you two are working on. It's great to see somebody in the space side and then on the nautical side working together. And you guys get along. And I like how Naeem's wearing blue to celebrate space and water. How perfect is that? <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing time with us and really enlightening us. Again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. So hey, my name is Ken Rakowski, and throughout this entire session today, we're going to be talking about things like aviation, autonomy. We have some incredible people who will be joining us from Hyperloop, from Uber. We have somebody that makes flying motorcycles that will be with us later on today. And also a gentleman named Marco Tempest. Marco Tempest has the dubious distinction of having more TED Talks, not TEDx, but TEDx.